All right. Welcome back, everybody. I am your host, Mike Craig, the founder, founder at NutriSlice and the host of the Past the Tots podcast. I am incredibly excited today. We have with us uh, uh, just a wonderful guest, Agnes Sherman from the University of Wisconsin, their housing, dining and culinary services team. Agnes is an assistant director there, but she is the focus. She focuses on nutrition and as a, you know, a personal professional background, she is a registered dietitian. Uh, I've had the personal opportunity to interact with Agnes a few times over the past year. I found her to be incredibly bright, intelligent, well-spoken, very thoughtful as it relates to um, food service, uh, being a dietitian, and then just the innovation and the great things that are happening on campus for students at the University of Wisconsin. So just incredibly excited to have you, Agnes. Welcome to uh, the Pass the Tots podcast. Ah, thanks so much, Michael. I appreciate it. <laughs> you know, for those that may not know you, you know, give us like a 20-second introduction to Agnes and and just the experience you've had professionally so far. Sure. Um, so I'm Agnes Sherman. I'm the registered dietitian here with Housing, Dining, and Culinary Services. And I've been a registered dietitian for um, a little over 20 years. And um, my experience spans from being a clinical dietitian to working in K-12 nutrition and then shifting into um, college and university food service. So my current focus in the position I'm in right now is one, nutrition um, uh, and also food safety and allergen safety. Um, in addition to that, I work a lot with um, food insecurity programming and making sure that we're serving our students on campus who are experiencing food, food insecurity. That is so great. I love that about you. And and I've yet to meet a dietitian that isn't incredibly altruistic and, and seeking to make the world a better place. So tell me more about this food insecurity and, and what that looks like on a, a college campus. Yeah, I think, I think over the last few years, um, it's been known and has been researched more that food insecurity is becoming more prevalent on college campuses, especially in the two-year um, community college campuses, and also additionally in four-year college campuses. And obviously there are a number of factors that impact that. Uh, the cost of tuition that goes up, uh, the number of perhaps federal Pell Grants that get awarded in comparison as a percentage of their total tuition costs have gone down. So I think food insecurity is becoming more prevalent because of some of those factors into, in addition to maybe some other things. Um, and so we have a, we have a responsibility to make sure we can help those students in some way. That's awesome. You know, you'd mentioned K-12 and there's, there's definitely a safety net inside K-12 dining where they have, you know, free and reduced, you know, programs and operations where students in need, uh, you know, they can come, they can get breakfast and lunch, snacks, sometimes their supper programs. You know what? What kind of things are available uh, in the college and, and higher education space? Yeah, I think what's really important is, um, depending on your college and university program, you know, there's opportunities for all you care to eat programming, or perhaps a la carte, which is pay for what you take. I think in our environment, what we're focused on as we shift to now all you care to eat dining, is one we're. In the food, in food insecurity aspect of it, we're not limiting the opportunities for students to try um, all different types of foods that they maybe would not have normally had access to with a standard declining balance or a la carte um, program. So even if a student is not purchasing a high level, high tier or high level program, they still have an opportunity to come dine with us in an all you care to eat environment and, and get really good healthy food and a variety of food that's gonna meet their needs. Um, and I think we have a good, we have an important role to play in that in terms of offering those opportunities, um, while also continuing to be fiscally responsible in our operations. That is so cool. And I'm so glad that you do this. Uh, you know, how, how prevalent is food insecurity? I mean, you kind of hinted on some of the data, but do you see this as something that higher education dining programs are going to need to embrace and have part of their, you know, their core operation as they kind of path and card out the next five to 10 years? Absolutely. It's super important. And the research can range anywhere from, you know, assessing how many times a week has a student felt food insecure to more concrete data and, and the actual data of 
what they're making, what the parental contribution is towards their education costs. Um, and it can range anywhere from, you know, 20% to 40% and depends on the research you're doing, but it's definitely gone up. And um, as food service operators, we have a responsibility to make sure obviously that, you know, we're, we're trying to be fiscally responsible in our operations, but there's ways for us to take unserved food because no one's perfect in their forecasting. No one's perfect in the amount of food we make based off who we serve. So any of that unserved food can be redirected for a better purpose. And that's our goal here at, at Housing DCS, which is take the unserved food that we have. How do we reproduce that into complete meals for students to be able to access? And that's the program that we run um, specific to housing. Yeah. And, and as he introduced kind of Housing DCS and the team, what this looks like, to talk a little bit about, you know, how many students do you serve? What does a, you know, operationally, what does the University of Wisconsin look like in, in housing DCS every day? <laughs> yeah, so the University of Wisconsin-Madison is unique in that we really have three food service food service operations on campus, and we're really just one of three. But we, mm-hmm. we serve a specific group of students because they're the residents that live with us in our residence halls and our dorms. Um, so we have approximately, depending on the academic year, anywhere from 8,600 I believe we're gonna be a little over 9,000 students for the next academic year. Um, So we have the potential to be feeding 9,000 students for three meals a day, um, which can be be spread out among six different dining locations that we have across campus. That's awesome. So, you know, 9,000 students are kind of in that area three-ish meals a day. And uh, that's that's quite the operation. How do you do it? <laughs> well, you know, there's a certain percentage that don't necessarily eat three, th- you know, three meals a day with us. So there are obviously those factors that we build into our day-to-day operation and anticipating um, what we have to prepare. Um, but ultimately it comes down to the system of our, of our technology and how our technology can help drive our efficiencies from day-to-day to make sure those students are fed. That's awesome. Oh, hold on to that. I would definitely want to get there. But, you know, when you look at your day, uh, Agnes, for you, what is the the best part of the day? You know, when you look at your job, what's the best part of the job for you? You know, I have such a variety of things I do in my day to day that if I can tackle, um, you know, three or four things at once and I'm accomplishing a, a ton of things in those short, to th- you know, in that short amount of time, that's a really good day for me. Um, I feel like if I can touch a lot of things at once, then I'm making more of an impact in the program. It's spoken like a true operator. If you can, yeah. uh, <laughs> if you can be super efficient with your time, then you get really excited. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, as we jump into um, your dining program, I think, you know, let's start with a few soft questions to kind of go from there. But, you know, uh, when you look at the, the dining program of, of DCS, you know, what is the vision? What is the kind of the brand, the you know, the, the mission statement, I don't know if, if there is one, but like, what do you feel like you represent and what does the, what's the purpose and, and the, the focus of, of your team? Well, obviously our focus is making sure that students that live with us um, can dine with us um, and have access to healthy, nutritious food to make them successful students. Um, these students are here with us for a good chunk of their, you know, year. Um, And we want to make sure we're providing service to those students every day that um, offers a good variety, offers healthy and nutritious food, um, and that gives them what they need to be successful students. Yeah, I mean, you you have mentioned, you know, around 9,000 students, multiple meals of the day, uh, healthy, nutritious food. Inside of that, I'd also say there's probably some diversity of, of what is being offered. So Let's just dive into that. So how do you how do you do it all? How do you create? Uh, let's let's start with menu transparency. You know, how do you communicate allergens and special diets to s- such a vast audience of students? Yeah, so that comes down to the technology we use to to really show our show our students what um, what we have available to them at our different different locations. So we have web menus that we utilize that, you know, all of our customers can access. Our six different market locations are um, run by a unit manager and also a unit chef. Those unit chefs are responsible for developing um, a four-week rotation throughout the academic year. Um, 
and that's seasonal. So they do it every semester. And so one given rotation is not going to be the same at one location versus another. And, and within that, we're trying to offer the variety that provides, you know, provide that variety for a number of students within, yeah. within housing. And, and inside of that, I'm guessing there's quite the need to display inside the transparency, special diets, allergens. And I believe just from what I've observed and learned, you know, you're very straightforward, very transparent in, in communicating those things in as many of the technologies as possible. Absolutely. It's super important. Um, it's not only because we need that transparency, but it's a safety factor too. Um, we have a number of students that come to us every year that declare a dietary allergy, maybe multiple dietary allergies, celiac disease, or perhaps other medically related nutritional concerns. And it's our responsibility to make sure that they can be fed successfully and safely. And that technology is important for us to know for them to know what they're going to be getting in their food. So um, from the from the standpoint of the operator, it's super important that we're taking a look at all the products that come to us from our distributors and our vendors, and we're analyzing those specifically for any of the top nine allergens that are associated with that product. Um, we also do account for other types of allergens as well. And how that information gets translated into our um, database management system will really impact what's being shown on our uh, physical food line signs when you walk into our locations, what might be on our digital signage, and what might and what's going to be on our web page. Um, and then our web menus are going to be able to allow that that customer to filter out any potential top nine allergens that they're concerned about. And that information that's shown to them is going to give them the information they need to see if they can eat that food. That's great. How long have you been doing this this detail, this level of transparency? Uh, this has been a consistent practice for us for, I mean, it, well over um, well over 15 years, almost 20 uh, years, I imagine. Yeah. yeah. I mean, really, before it's it's really taken hold in the United States, and it's it's kind of the, a de facto best practice now. Like everyone needs to be doing and communicating this level of detail. Uh, I mean, you, if you're ready for a hard question, so how have you done this uh, amidst the pandemic, where you've got now? Um, you know, labor shortages, supply chain challenges, like uh, how, how do you maintain this all uh, through, through, through the current challenges of the day? Yeah, it's, it's a lot of teamwork. That's what it comes down to. <laughs> and a lot of quick, a lot of quick action on our part. Um, we, we as a, uh, as a administrative group really focus on um, what are the appropriate substitutions um, if we have issues with supply chain, are those substitutions appropriate to um, bring into the stream of our food inventory. Um, is it safe? Is it gonna have the same or less allergens as the product we were really intending to serve? And so it takes a lot of coordination with myself as the dietitian, with our executive chef, and with our purchasing assistant director, which is, you know, which, who is also actually a registered dietitian, and really coming together and making sure these products are gonna be safe for our students to eat. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, you know, just a follow-up question to that, just diving into the transparency, use a lot of technology, uh, you know, without getting into too specifics, maybe walk through your tech stack. What are you using to communicate to the students, um, you know, at all the various touch points? You mentioned a website. I know you, you got your thought leaders with apps and uh, ro mm -hmm. robots and delivery. You do it all. We do it all. So our, obviously our very basic is our web menus. We, we post our menus seven days in advance so that customers have access to a lot of information at, at any given point. Um, during our summer programming, those menus are available 30 days in advance because we're working with a lot of uh, youth groups, uh, youth camps. Um, so that information is really important, especially for parents who are concerned about what their child is going to eat. Um, so that's just the first basic technology that we want to make sure we're, we're accurate and, um, you know, offering yeah. it, that's going to be um, accurate and um, safe for that student or for that customer. We have uh, a lovely system of robot delivery. I am uh, a robot delivery system called Starship. Um, Starship is what we use to... Um, deliver food to students at any given point, wherever they are on campus. Um, once they pin their location, we'll prepare that order for them and throw it in that robot and it travels on down to campus and wherever they pin their location is where it will go. And so, this, is for, this is for residential. I mean, essentially this is the residential program. 
it is a residential program, but anybody who has the Starship app and it is on location in terms of um, the serving, or I'm sorry, the the, um, the 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 boundaries of where where the robots can travel, as long as they're within those boundaries, um, they can pin a location and order from us if they like. That's you awesome. don't have to necessarily be a resident with us. That's awesome. Now, your Madison, Wisconsin, I, I can only imagine what this looks like in the month of January. Uh, I think I know the answer, but even in January, these robots are they're making trips. They're logging back and forth. They're logging miles. <laughs> yeah, they, they are definitely logging miles. Um, they've got some pretty sturdy wheels on them that can traverse <laughs> different curbs and little snow banks and things like that. Um, they go to a little central location at the end of the day. They go to sleep, get recharged, and get ready for the next day. I mean, so uh, there's, some, there's probably some great stories out there that, that you could share, but what has kind of robots and delivery, what has this taught you about this modern consumer, this new, this new college student and, and their preferences for engaging in a dining program? Yeah, I think, I think the pandemic has really driven a lot of this technology. And um, I also think that the sort of square peg and a round hole analogy of the number of students we serve, given the actual physical space we have to serve them, has also impacted how we can embrace techno technology to make it easier to serve students. So if we have um, a robot system that can deliver food that a student can purchase off their meal plan and get delivered to their dorm, um, then all the better because that's one less seat that we have to maybe fill that someone else can take once they come, you know, into the location. Um, but we're still offering that opportunity for a meal. I, I also think though that, and I, and I, I work with student dietitians and interns that say that really the impact of the pandemic was they just don't want to go out as much. And yeah. I think the robots have made this, um, <laughs> possible. We'll definitely touch on convenience in a second, but uh, just real quick, do you know offhand maybe the longest delivery distance that the robot can make and or has made, and what has been the shortest one, if you know? <laughs> so so we actually have a few um, markets that um, run robots out of their locations. I believe four, uh, actually I should say, we have, I believe three out of six of our dining locations, and we do have a Starbucks location that utilizes the robots to deliver food. Um, so it can go all the way across campus or campus is very big, um, from end to end, it's well over a couple miles. Um, so it could go anywhere from our, uh, Lakeshore site of campus all the way out to our university hospital location and our university apartments location, which is a, a quite a bit of a hike. Yeah. Um, we have students that live right next door to some of our dining locations <laughs> and will use the robot. for delivery. <laughs> That would be me, <laughs> especially on a yeah. cold day. <clears throat> yeah. Excuse me. On a cold day, like well, yeah. I, I could just go across the street, but it's, <clears throat> it's cold. I'm just gonna send a robot. <laughs> that's right. That's right. We've had it happen, <clears throat> and you know what? Uh, that's that's fine. We're gonna we're gonna make sure that student is served. So there, ne there needs to be some type of an award, right? Like uh, the most. Uh, it, it's not so much laziness as maybe like the most most uh the student most interested in convenience award. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Um, besides the robot technology, we do have a we do have a, a smartphone app that we utilize specific for food allergy safety, um, and that is another piece, especially with my job that I focus on, where we want to make sure that students that are managing dietary allergies are accommodated. Um, and this particular smartphone app will allow them to order off a clean label menu that is um, gluten free, peanut and tree nut free, and is free of the other top nine. Um, allergens. Um, they can order food off this app, come to a location to pick it up, and we have a very strenuous process on how that food is prepared specific to that 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 student's order. That's fantastic. Thank you for doing all that. That's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, you know, also, I know you're, I'm aware of just mainstream ordering apps, and so there's, there's so many ways and touch points that you're connecting with students, and uh, I, I love it. When you look at the process for innovation at uh, DCS, like what, what's the approach and the philosophy? What have you learned or what would you teach other, you know, food service operators around how to innovate with technology? Yeah, I, I really think the approach with DCS is no st stone should not be turned over, right? I think we need to take those opportunities and see what technologies are out there um, that can improve our systems 
can make it efficient, not only for our customers, um, but really we're thinking about how it can be efficient and helpful for our, our employees. And so our goal is to make sure that the technologies can interface and be successful with our current systems. Um, maybe it allows us to reassess what current systems we have and what, what we might need to adjust down the road. Um, but also well, it encourages us to show our, our staff that we're really trying to look out for the most efficiency possible to make their job easier, uh, especially given the labor market the way it is right now. Yeah, I mean, what I'm hearing is that innovation always starts with the customer experience. And so you're always uncovering any stones, right? Always looking for the next thing that will improve the dining experience, the that guest experience. But at the same time, you also evaluate through the lens of an operator and, and trying to measure and, and evaluate how is this going to impact operator experience as well. And really the, the ones that take the, the innovations that work, the technologies that work seem to be dancing around the idea of we can simplify the operator experience and do great things for your customer. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's always going to be ever changing. So it's important that we stay up, you know, keep up with the trends. Um, and hopefully, you know, um, those, those innovators out there that are doing these third party platforms really start to understand how the CU new platform works and how they can best impact our efficiencies, um, to really, um, you know, efficiently serve our students and to make it easy for our students to get food. That's awesome. You know, there, there's probably just real fast, uh, just one or two more questions about your program here, but do you consider, or do you think through as a, as an institute or sorry, as a team, any like rivals or you com competitors that you would compete against that? I'm just curious. In terms of our competitors, it comes down to what can a student get for us from us as a product and what can they get, you know, two blocks down the street from their dorm and what are they paying for that product? And again, I think that is really what's helping to drive towards this all you care to eat concept as well, because if you're paying only a certain amount of money for a swipe and you get this wonderful variety of food within the marketplace, um, that's a better value to them than perhaps going down the street and grabbing a burger from someplace else. It's compelling. Um, yeah. And then when you layer in all the things you're doing with convenience, with delivery, uh, I mean, it, it starts to fulfill a lot of the demands the modern consumer is having today. And that's great. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, what have you done or how do you, you know, if you were to teach a class on how to build trust and loyalty with students, what would be some of the, the core things that you would want to get across as, as what you do and what you believe? Well, you know, there are customers and I think their input is super important to, to our day to day and we want them to be heard. So if we're offering them platforms to provide feedback, um, to offer us information that, you know, they feel would help, help their day to day and, and make it more enjoyable for them to dine with us. That's where we're going to start building that trust is listening to them and trying to implement some of their ideas. And so dining and culinary services does utilize, um, a dining advisory board, which is made up of students that live with us. Um, they are responsible for soliciting feedback from our customers, which is our residents. We take that information and we see what we can do. Is it something they hate? Is it something that they want to see? Those are all things that we take in consideration in collaboration with our executive chef, uh, you know, our, the, the purchasing director, myself, uh, obviously our director of dining services plays a big role in this. Mm -hmm. um, all of the leadership team really is impacted by this feedback and we want to make sure we're, we're, we're listening to that stu to those, to those students. Yeah. Trust and loyalty built through uh, just good listening and, and then taking that feedback and making the appropriate changes. Yeah. I, you know, I think the other thing is, is we need to, we need to put out a good product. Um, it needs to taste great. It needs to look great. We need to make sure our staff is invested in putting out a great product and that they take pride in the work we're doing um, to offer that great product. So, you know, it's working with our team quite a bit to, to see how we can push things to be, you know, to get it to, for improvement. Um, I think that we, we have to rely on the fact that they're the front of the house experts. And we want to make sure that not only are we taking the feedback from our students, but we're taking their feedback as well into consideration and how to best run the operation more efficiently. That's fantastic. And hopefully I'm not putting you on the spot too much, but 
what kind of feedback are there specific takeaways that you've seen post pandemic or kind of as we've navigated this this calendar of school year uh, as, as this this team has listened and, and engaged in dialogue have there been any themes that you've extracted that that you'll be making changes into the future you know i th- i think part of it is we will continue to assess as we transition to an all you care environment as our primary mode of service how we are better impacting our students in that service and our front of the house staff is going to be critical in offering that feedback to us yeah. so um you know I, I guess to answer your question i i would hope i would hope that we're we're taking into consideration all of those aspects um and we're really you know we're really trying to assess the best way to move forward with it because it is so important. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I think it's fantastic that you're just got listening ears and, and really soliciting and encouraging, Hey, help us know how we should shape the student experience uh, because student success is, is such a critical component of, uh, sorry, student success and dining really do work hand in hand. And you want these students to have good experiences when they, they step into your locations. You know, as we, as we kind of close down the conversation, Agnes, thank you very much for, for joining us for a few minutes today. Uh, just absolutely love hearing from you. When you kind of steer the future, look into the next few years, you know, uh, what are you seeing and how are you kind of shaping your program to meet the demands and the needs, uh, you know, of what you anticipate will be the future? You know, I think it comes down to understanding what our peers are doing and understanding what our customers need as time moves forward. This pandemic has, like you mentioned earlier, has really impacted service. Um, Beyond the college and university environment, you hear stories every day about how small businesses are struggling with labor um, and how they're adjusting and adapting. Um, Using that technology with third-party delivery services um, the online apps that people are using, uh, those are all things that have really been driven the last couple of years because of the pandemic. And it's only, it's only going to push forward in that, in that format. I, things are not going to go back to the way they were. And so we need to continuously understand that we're not going to be, um, running our operations as we were five years ago. We're going to continuously look at how we drive efficiencies within our operation, um, and take the technologies that we can find that are being offered out there to us to see if they are, they're a good fit for us to, to serve our customers. Awesome, awesome. <clears throat> well, Agnes Sherman, the Assistant Director, Registered Dietitian at mm-hmm. the University of Wisconsin in Madison, working out of the Housing, Dining, and Culinary Services team. Fantastic to have you. As we close down, there is just one more question to ask. and really curious your experience here but when you think through you know all the all the experiences and dining you know events and uh you know even just the day-to-day stuff has there been a dining experience that uh, you can recall that just stands out as hey this is how it should be done uh specific with cnu or as a personal experience anywhere anywhere agnes Well, obviously, if you, if you wanted to be weighted on hand and foot, that would be the best dining experience <laughs> ever. But I, I think overall, what it comes down to is my best dining experience is um, a meal that I receive that has been um, thoughtful in terms of its innovation and creation is, ta- is you know, it tastes amazing. And um, it provides me the nourishment I need as a, you know, because I'm a registered dietitian, I need that nourishment, right? <laughs> so I think for me in particular, my best dining experience is going to be something that's going to be of high quality and um, it's going to be tasty and nutritious for me. Um, and so usually what I, what I have found is that um, I can get that experience at a lot of different providers and different operations and different restaurants. Um, And so I don't know if there's any single best experience I've had because there's a lot of great operators out there and I don't want to give credit to only one. So (laughs) I hope that that's a great roundabout way to answer that question. Well, Agnes Sherman, it has been fantastic to to have you on for a few minutes today. Thank you very, very much for passing the thoughts. Yeah, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Michael. All right. Well, as we close today, 
Agnes Sherman from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Assistant Director, Registered Dietitian for the DCS, the Dining Culinary Services Team. Just a fantastic operation. Uh, really, really thoughtful approach in how they communicate menus, just the innovations around transparency and meeting the guest experiences with uh, convenience and, and technology, always listening and making adjustments, ma- making you know the right adjustments to meet the ever-changing demands of today's modern consumer. Uh, what a wonderful, wonderful podcast. And thank you everyone for being here, for passing the tots. I'm your host, Mike Craig, and we will see you next time.